First Peter chapter one verses twenty two to twenty five. Uh, my Bible kind of outlines it. Love one another. Your Bible might also say the same thing. J. Vernon McGee said this. Your relationship to the Word of God will lead you to a right relationship with other believers. Jesus said it this way. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If we were to live by the word of God, then our relationships would reflect our love for the word of God. Because we're applying the word of God. Just as James says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And so, J. Vernon McGee is saying this. If the word of God has become a part of us, then our relationships with one another will reflect that through love. And we're going to talk about love today. Love for the brethren. A mother asked her young son what he would like for his birthday. I'd like a little brother, Mom. Oh my, that's a big wish, the mother said. Why do you want a little brother? Well, said the boy, there's only so much I can Blame on the dog. (laughs) Loving one another. Last week we looked at verses 17 through 21. Peter actually gave us some instruction. As the epistles are instructional. And Peter gave us instructions how we ought to conduct ourselves while we're here on this earth. In fear and reverence of God. As believers... We are to reflect the nature of Christ to this world. First to God, because we're to love God first, and then to our neighbors, right? And to our brothers. And so we're to live in fear and reverence of God. Not fear trembling, but that He is our God, He is our Savior, He is our King, He is our Lord. And we're to reverence Him. We're to love Him. He also instructed us so that our faith and our hope in God would grow. And that's the heart of God, is that each one of us would grow in our faith, in our hope in Him. That hope would grow, that when we go through difficult times, when we're struggling, that that our hope in Him would increase, knowing that He takes care of us, that He watches out for us. And He has a future and a hope, Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us. He has a future and a hope for every one of us. And so every one of us should always hope for the better. Hope for God's blessings. Hope for the future because we're children of God. And in our hope, we then have faith in God knowing that we can trust in Him with our very lives. And so Peter here will be talking about our love for our Christian brother. And I want to keep it in that context. I mean, obviously, we expressed our love for the community on Thursday. Uh, to reach out to this community, we took a step of faith. We didn't know how it would work out. We didn't even know if anyone would show up, but we took a step of faith and said, look, we want to just express God's love. And that was really the whole purpose, not necessarily witnessing or or trying to uh, evangelize, though if the Lord led that in that way, we would do it. But to, just to let them know we love you and we care about you and we want to feed you and give you some clothing and so forth. And, and that was a love that Jesus had, that the Father had, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And so we love the world enough to give of ourselves for that time, to give of our foods. Many of you brought turkeys. I don't know how many turkeys were cooked, like 10 turkeys, something like that, 10, 12 turkeys that were cooked. We had probably three left over. And you'll be enjoying turkey today for free, you know, with stuffings and all the trimming. And hopefully you'll stick around and have some fellowship with us. You know, but we express that love that way. But there is also another love, the love that we have one for another as brethren. And Peter will be talking about that love, another instructional message here on how we ought to love one another. Now, we struggle with that love. I struggle with that love. All of us struggle with that love. And if you think you have the love that it takes, you don't. You don't have that love. In fact, we can't even love one another. 
The only way that we can love is through Jesus Christ and allowing him to love through us. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that because our conception of what love is is so distorted. We really don't have the right idea of what love is and the right definition. I know when, when I was growing up in this world, I met my wife at the age of 13, and I thought that I was in love, but it really wasn't love. It was, it was more lust than love because of this beautiful blonde little girl who I fell in love with but more lusted over and then had a relationship and then had children. And even all that time that we were together until about 20, 24 years old or so, actually 22 years old, I would oftentimes tell her, I don't know if I love you. I was honest with her and I said, I can't say that I love you because I don't know what love is. I really don't know what love is. I had no idea of what the concept of love meant. Some of us old timers, you know, you guys understand the word love. I think we, you grew up in a religious system. You grew up the old way. But today it's just so confusing on what love is. It's so based upon emotions and feelings. And it is not that at all. And it wasn't until I met Christ that I realized what love was. And that I could tell my wife, I love you. I love you. And so we'll talk about this love. And so Peter starts off in verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. The word purified there is speaking of defilements, impurities. And so he's talking about the saints, the believers purifying their souls. Now how do you purify your soul? How do you make your soul right with God? How do you purify it from impurities and and defilements and sin? Well, obviously, we can't today purify our own souls. It's impossible for us. No matter how hard you try to do the right thing, to say the right thing, to feel the right thing, it's impossible to do that. In the Old Testament, they would purify their souls through ceremonial bathing. They would wash themselves ceremonially, religiously. And then they had this sense of, okay, God has forgiven me because I've washed myself. And it was a sort of a work. And they felt this sense of, of release that, okay, I'm, I'm pure to a certain degree until the first time that they go out and then they become undefiled again. Whether touching a body, a dead body, or whether someone that's leprous or a Gentile, then they became defiled again. And so in the Old Testament, it just proved that we could not purify our own souls. So obviously, we do not have the power to produce a personal purity. And God knows that we've tried to be right, but we just can't be right. Uh, how many have thought that, that because we help the less fortunate, that we feel better about ourselves and that maybe God kind of will shine on us a little bit, you know, because we've helped the less fortunate. I used to think that way. I helped the homeless or, or I helped the underdog. And so, you know, maybe God is going to you know, bless me a little bit. He's going to he's going to give me a good, good thing, you know, coming down my way, you know, kind of a karma type of thing, which I don't agree with. But if I do good then good will come my way, that type of thing. But it never purified my soul because my soul was still wretched and wicked inside. And only I know that. But it's through God. It's through the Holy Spirit purifying our souls when we ask Jesus into our hearts. The only way that our souls can be purified. In fact, we can't even maintain the purification. It only comes through Jesus Christ. And so we need to have faith and trust in Him. What is the evidence of this purified soul in this context? We'll look at the next statement. Through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. Evidence of this purified soul is that there's a hunger or a desire to love the brethren in sincerity. Though we may not feel it and we may not desire it, but God gives us a hunger to love like he loved because we experienced his love. And so we should have a desire to love one another, loving the brethren. Holy living is incomplete if it isn't accompanied by love. Love. What kind of love should we have? Well, Corinthians tells us right off the bat, right? Paul tells us what love is. And when I first read this, I said, okay, here we go. Now I know what love is because the scriptures tell me what love is. Though I didn't know what love was and I could tell my wife, you know, hey, 
I like being with you. I enjoy our intimacy. You know, I, I love hanging out and doing things, but do I love you? How does that even feel? You know, how does that even feel? Because I, I can feel towards you a certain way, but I also feel that way towards other people. You know, and so it, it's so diluted today that you have this confusion of what love is. And so you have people in the world saying, well, you can love one person just as much as you love another person. And so you can have two wives or you can have an open relationship. You know what an open relationship is, right? Some of you may not know what it is, but it's where you're married, but you're open to whatever. You might fall in love with someone else. And so go ahead and enjoy yourself because, you know, you have enough love to give to everyone. And that's a sensual, erotic type of love. It's not the agape love that the Bible speaks about. It's a false love. And so Paul gives us a definition of what love is in 1 Corinthians 13.4. Write that down. This is what love is. Love suffers long. In other words, love is patience. And so when we are to love one another, we are to be patient with one another. Well, how long do we, how long do we apply patience? Patient. <laughs> Continue to be patient. Until the Lord returns, we are to be patient with one another. That's a sign that you love someone. They offend you, they upset you, you disagree, be patient. You just be patient. Look at all the saints in the Old Testament. They all had flaws. Did they all love one another? Did Saul love David? He threw a spear at David. Did Samuel love David? Samuel pronounced judgment on Saul. And Samuel loved David. Jonathan loved David. David loved Jonathan. How about Paul and Barnabas? They got into a heated argument, didn't they? Over Mark. Did they love each other? Whose fault was that? Patience. Paul says, be patient. In time, God will reveal all things. Not only love is patience, but love is kind. So in all your strength, be kind to one another. Love doesn't envy. Boy, if you envy, then get rid of that envy. You can't envy others, what they have, what ministry they have, what ministry you don't have, what vehicles they drive, what houses they, they purchase, you know, those, those things that cause us to have envy in our hearts. Get rid of that because that's not love. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. Love isn't rude. Get out of my way. Get out of my way. You know, type of rude attitude. Burping all over the place. That's rude. Uh, that bugs me. That's just one area that I just don't like when someone burps. Just like, that's so rude. It's like, like I want to really hear you take the inner air of your stomach and bring it outside, you know, with a scent and, and involved in it. It's like, oh, you know, I, I can't stand it, you know. I think it's rude. Cutting in line is rude, you know, saving uh, spaces for people and then cutting in line is rude. You know, those things that are rude, you know what's rude, right? Just, it's not love. He goes on and says, does not seek its own. Love doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. Thinks no evil. Boy, that's a hard one. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity. That is sin. You don't rejoice in sin. Uh, even, even in the world, if somebody is in sin and it causes them to, to suffer, we're not to go, yeah, well, it's about time they got what they deserved, you know, type of thing. We can't do that. That's not love. Rejoices, it love rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now let me ask you, how many of you do those things? Anybody? Come on. We don't. There's evil always in our minds. We're not patient at all. But this is the goal. This is the measuring stick. This is, this is the, the, Take the end of the line where you pass over and say, I did it, you know. I've reached the end of this race. Now, how do we do it then? Well, listen to what he, go, he says in the next statement. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. The word love there is agapeo, where we get the word agape, unconditional love. And we're to love one another with a fervent heart, a pure heart. The word fervent means stretch out the hand. In other words, it means to go further, to be stretched out than what you're normally to do. And, and so like Thursday, 
Normally you celebrate your Thanksgiving with family and so forth, but you actually stretched yourself and said, look, I'm going to take a part of that day and I'm going to do something different that I normally don't do and I'm going to spend it serving someone else. That's stretching yourself out. And that's what it's talking about. Serving or loving one another fervently, stretching yourself out with a pure heart, without pretense. Without pretense. Again, those are hard things to do. To love one another. Peter is saying, stretch yourself to the limit in loving others and let it not be sacri- let it be sacrificial and selflessness. Now, he's speaking to the brethren. To us here, we are to stretch ourselves to love one another with a pure heart. We find this theme throughout the Bible, don't we? We find it throughout the Bible. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, that we are to love. God is love. God didn't have to learn love. God is love. Love flows from God. His very nature is love. Everything he does is by love. Because he is love. And we are to be like him. To love one another. Jesus said that it was the second commandment to love one another. The first is what? To love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now in this context, again, I'm speaking to us as believers, loving your brother in Christ. And as Christians, we should try to get along with the people that we're around. We should try to love one another. That doesn't mean that we always have to agree with them, because we won't agree on everything. As I said, Paul didn't agree with Barnabas. Got into this big old debate over Mark, who was being lazy and wasn't doing what he should have been doing. And so they started arguing. Paul says, you know what, I don't want to take him. He's he's wasting my time. I'm on a mission. And now, remember, Paul just got saved. He's excited. He's getting to know Christ, and he's on fire for the Lord. And he loves God. And all of a sudden, this young kid's there, and he's not doing what he's supposed to do. He's like, I don't want to take him. And Barnabas says, hey, come on, give him a chance. Give him an opportunity. I can almost hear Barnabas. Do you love him? Come on, express a little bit of Christ's love there. Wait a minute. Does he love anyone? Because he's wasting my time. And he's the one not showing love because he's not doing something. So who's right there? I have no idea. I can tell you Mark was probably wrong and he needed to grow up. And then later on, Paul finally said, hey, tell Mark to come over because I think uh, he's an advantage to us now. But was he saying that he's always been an advantage or was he saying he finally matured and now he's an advantage? Now there's grace and he can come back. You know, I don't know. It doesn't really say. I kind of believe that that's probably the case, though, that Paul, that Mark needed to grow up a little bit and learn. And then he was usable by the Lord. And sometimes you have to let people go so they grow up and then God can use them. But it doesn't mean that you don't love them because you don't want them to go around with you. And Paul didn't want them because he was wasting his time. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. But Barnabas did. He had a little more grace, I could say. Upon Mark, but doesn't mean that he he um, didn't love him any more or less, and so forth. So we're not going to always get along, but we're to love one another. We're to be patient. We're not be rude. We're to wait for the Lord. But we shouldn't be not intentionally looking for opportunities to anger each other or to upset each other either. That's not what we do. Love looks through the eyes of Jesus. Think about that for a second. It looks through the eyes of Jesus. This is what I've learned. That I can't love. And in fact, if I can be honest with you, not that I'm not honest. I hate when people say that. Can I be honest with you? So what, you're saying you're never honest with us? No, what I'm saying is I'm emphasizing that I want to be honest with you about myself. That in these latter days, it's harder for me to love people. It's a struggle. Because I've been hurt so much by people that I've tried to love. I've tried to pour myself into. And then they let me down. And so it's harder to love people because in your mind you start thinking, they're going to let you down too. So why am I wasting my time trying to pour in what God has shown me and taught me into someone's life. And then down the road they're going to get upset and leave. It's very difficult. And lately I've been praying, Lord, you need to remove that and I need to have the eyes of Christ because Christ didn't look at the situations like that. He loved Judas Iscariot just as much as he loved the disciples. He poured into Judas Iscariot all the way up until the very end. 
And when we have the eyes of Christ and put the eyes of Christ on, then we view people through the eyes of Christ and in His love. And we really need to, in a sense, step aside from ourselves and put the eyes of Christ on, like putting on glasses and say, okay, this is how Jesus would view people. And then live that way. Live that way. And love them that way. Be patient. Be kind. So forth. You can't do it in your own flesh and strength. And I was just being honest, but I will do it through the eyes of Christ. You look at the situation in the garden when uh, Jesus was in the, in the garden praying and the disciples were praying and then the, the guard, temple guards came to take him. And then there was Peter who all of a sudden pulled out a sword. You remember that? Now, was that love? You know, was that love for him to pull out a sword? Jesus said, put down the sword, but he pulls the sword out to defend Jesus. He was loving Jesus, defending Jesus, but at the same time, he cut the ear off of, of Malchus, right? Now, that was love towards the Gentile. But then all of a sudden, you see Jesus express this love towards Malchus. What did he do? He reached down, he picked up the ear, he put it back on his head, and he healed him. I think that's love. Did he heal him? For Peter's sake or for Malchus' sake? I think both. One is that Peter couldn't be accused of doing any harm to anyone. Two, that Malchus would stand there or actually kneel there, if that's the case, go, wow, I just experienced God. I can now hear, I mean really hear, through this ear. But we see the love of Jesus in that situation, both for Peter and for Malchus. The eyes of Christ, looking through the eyes of Christ. Romans twelve eighteen says, If it at all possible, as much as it depends on you. Notice it says on you. We always think, no, it's on them. It's up to them. It's what they want to do, but it's on you. Live peaceably with all men. It depends on you, not others, and how you live with other individuals. This verse does not say it will always be possible, but it, if it is possible... We need to live in peace with one another. Agape love is neither a sentimental or emotional type of love. So often depicted in our TV, television, movies, and magazines that love is emotional and you have to feel it. Well, I have to feel like I love and I still hear it. I don't feel that I love this individual or I've fallen out of love with that individual. Because I don't feel that love for that individual any longer. Love is not a feeling. Well, wait a minute though. I feel love. Exactly. It's when you apply the agape, unconditional love, that the feeling comes behind it. It enforces your love. And you sense that love for that individual. We're created emotional beings. Because we're to yearn or hunger for God. God has created us so that we have a deep, intimate love for Him. And that love then flows over to others also. But love is not a sentimental, emotional thing. The world has taken it, as I said earlier, and they've taken this emotional love and said, you know, I can love anybody. And so I can love this person and then fall out of love, and it's okay. And it's good for both of us because we don't want to be in a situation where... Where it's not good for both of us. And so you can divorce and be friends and move on and fall in love with someone else and have this intimate, sentimental, you know, out vacation in Hawaii and traveling and just really experimenting and all this emotions and so forth. And then all of a sudden one day when it really comes down to living life together and the struggles and the heartaches, boom. I, I, can't, I don't love you anymore. I had a friend whose dad had um, left his mother for another woman. And it was probably years and years and years. <clears throat> and this man got cancer. This man got cancer. She put him in the car drove to his mom's house and opened the door, laid him on the, on the ground, and drove off. 
the mom went out there and said, what's going on? He said, I have cancer and she doesn't want to take care of me. She grabbed him, put him into the house, and took care of him until he died. She is a godly Christian woman. She's been all her life. She <clears throat> taught this friend of mine how to read the Bible when he was a little kid. This man had this fling, this emotional, sentimental love, but it, when it really came right down to it, she didn't love him. And it was all emotional and based upon the exterior because she didn't really commit herself to him. That's not love. True love commits. Instead of, instead, agape love demands an act of obedience by the lover for the lovey and thus represents a specific personal choice or act of the lover's will. That's what love is. It's a choice to love that individual in spite of them from your perspective. No matter what is going on, you're going to love that individual. You're going to be there for them. It's obedience out of God's word. But when we allow our emotions and feelings to enter in, that's where we begin to stray from the love of God and make our judgment calls. Look, God is very clear. He demands that we, as brothers in Christ, love one another. The only way to do that is to let Jesus love through you. It's the only way to do it. You can put on the eyes of Christ and see people that way. And then once you do that, then you allow Christ to love through you. So you step aside again and say, okay, Lord, you love them because I can't love them. And there are times where we will not be able to love an individual, but we let Jesus love them. It's like we get out of the way and just let Jesus love them. And we let him love through us by our acts and our submission to him and our obedience to him. And then we love others. And that's the only way we can love. Because I can't love in the natural. There have been many a times where an individual upsets you. You're struggling with them. You don't rub. You rub each other wrong. You know, you just don't get along. And you have a choice. Do I love them or do I not love them? And it's so easy to just say, I don't want to love them. I'd rather just forget them and move on somewhere else. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to, you know, like J. Vernon McGee says, eat chicken together every night. You know, that doesn't have to happen. Sometimes we just can't get along. And Barnabas and Paul separated and they went their ways. And God can continue to work. But we have to have that love, at least the basic aspect of loving one another, a mutual respect. We can disagree agreeably. And that's wonderful and that's fine. You know, and leave it at that. And let God do the rest. But we need to let God live through us. First John 3.14 says, We know that we passed, out, we passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. If you don't love and can't express that love and allow Christ to love in you, then you really haven't passed from death to life. You haven't experienced the love of Christ and what he's done for you. You need to let him live through you. If you abide in life, then your desire should be that God lives through you. Peter's exhortation is to love one another. And especially during the time of persecution. During a time of persecution, it, it, it's an interesting situation to be in because there's so much pressure, so much stress. The conditions of hardship uh, bring out the worst in us sometimes. It can bring out disagreements. And it can take on gigantic things because of the stress that's going on. The, the hope of something happening and it's not happening. And things are being uh, neglected or things are falling apart. Or others are saying things and there's a stress and persecution and suffering. can lead you to all of a sudden react. In a certain way, I've seen it. I've seen it because we don't get our ways. Or things aren't happening the way we think it should be happening. You know, and I've just learned this, you know, whatever God wants. It's whatever God wants. He, he's going to do the work. And we just need to sit back and say, okay, that's fine. We can disagree agreeably and move, move on. But Peter was exhorting them because they were suffering so much. But don't lose the love for one another. 
help one another, take care of one another as they're being persecuted and even beheaded and killed and so forth for their faith. <clears throat> because that's a sign of commitment to God. To be a Christian means to have a sincere love of the brethren and exercise fervently. And so he says in verse 23, having been born again. That's the only way you're going to do it. Having been born again. So since, in other words, the Holy Spirit has given you a new life, making you a partaker of the divine nature of Christ, that's one of those communicable attributes of God that you can have, and that is to love one another as children of God. So we should love one another. Children in Inherit the nature of their parents, don't they? You're just like your parent. I'm like my mom. She just said it today. He's like me. He never smiles. I wouldn't say never, but he rarely smiles or occasionally smiles, you know. And my boys are like me. Modesto's just like me, almost to the T. Hey, that rhymed. It's rare that I rhyme something. And my other boys are like me too. They take certain qualities from me and then yet they take qualities from their mother because she's so gentle and emotional and caring and so they take on that caring gentle emotional aspect where i don't give that to them you know, that's not how i brought them up because my mission and be honest with you is when i was raising my boys i wanted to raise them so they were ready for the world so when this world began to attack them they knew how to hold their end up, you know, and that's all I was concerned about. Though I love them, and I deeply do love them, but it was a different type of relationship, and it still is to this day. doesn't mean I don't love them, but we reflect our parents, and so if we reflect our parents, you know, then how much more should we reflect our heavenly parent, God, who loves unconditionally, right? You think about the love that he has for us individually, the things that we've done that nobody knows, and yet he's still so lovingly so kind he still blesses us and like god why you well then give some of that away too to others is the world worthy of love <laughs> no not at all but yet god loves the world we find a great example of brotherly love in first samuel chapter 20 i mean you have this mutual respect between jonathan and david an amazing love that these two men had for each other. Both both princes, both destined to be kings, both mighty men of war, both valor, both respectful, both loving one another, unconditionally with one another, yet they both respected the place that God had placed upon their life. David knew that God had anointed him to be king. Jonathan knew that God anointed David to be king. So Jonathan was ready to step aside and let God do what he wanted to do in David's life. There was no envy in their relationship whatsoever. There was no control but to allow God to control. All there was was sincere, pure love of the heart for one another. That's rare to find. I think of Romaine and Pastor Chuck. I think that was the type of relationship that they had. Where Romaine knew that I'm called to be here for Pastor Chuck, to fill in for Pastor Chuck, to serve Pastor Chuck so that God can do what he needs to do through Pastor Chuck. And I'll tell you what, Romaine probably gets rewards for a lot of the fruit that Pastor Chuck also has. There's always got to be somebody that's holding up the arms of those that are leading in the church. How do we do this? Because we're born again. And notice how we're born again, the next statement, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word logos the doctrine of god which lives and abides forever it's by the spirit of god that we're born again not of corruptible uh, not of the flesh but of the spirit that we are born again because verse 24 because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass highlight that in your bibles all the glory of man as the flowers of the grass, the grass withers and the flowers fade away. Your glory is nothing. <laughs> we glory in our works. We glory in our righteousness. We glory in the things that we do, but that's going to fade away. I love the word that he uses here, withers. 
withers away. The literal Greek is dried up. Literally, it dries, right? You, you take a, a plant, and it has moisture in it when it's growing, right? The leaves are moisture. You squeeze it, and you can actually squeeze out some of the moisture. We are filled with water. Most of our body is water. And guess what? As we get older, what are we doing? We're drying up. We literally are drying up. Our muscles are drying up. That's why they don't stretch as much. Our bones are fragile because they don't have the fluid in the bones, and so they break easier. We're drying up as we get older. Where's our glory? Drying up. That's who man is. We're incapable of having any glory because any glory that we have eventually will dry up and fade away, just like the grass. Amazing to have that perspective and yet to know that God still loves us and that he wants to use us because he is so willing to share his glory with us. And so when we glory, we glory in the Lord because his glory is everlasting and we can glory in what he has done through us. And so as he loves through us, glory be to God that I get to partake of his love flowing from my heart to others. Because it's only done by God and not by my glory or my power or my strength, but by the glory of God. That he will use a vessel that's drying up to love others. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, I love that. Peter sticks it right in there because it's by the word that we are born again. We have to hear the word and understand the word and know that we must confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. And we'll be saved because the word of God is true and it will last forever. This isn't just a book written by a bunch of men, as many would probably say, but is a book that contains the mind of God and the state of man. It contains the way of salvation. It contains the doom of sinners and the happiness of believers. And it's only found in the word of God. Spurgeon said this, God's word never dies. God's word never changes. There are some who think that we ought to get a new gospel every few years or even every few weeks. But that was not Peter's notion here. He wrote and he was divinely inspired to write concerning the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We have so many trans. I'm going to let me rephrase that. Not translations. We have so many paraphrases of the Word of God. There are a few translations, and there's a difference. And I get tired of hearing people on the radio, well, I use this translation, the message. That's not a translation. That's a paraphrase from a man who's writing what he thinks it's saying. A translation is taking the original and literally translating it on paper and not giving me your opinion. The New King James is a translation. The King James is a translation. Message is a paraphrase the living bible a paraphrase they're not translations today the homosexual agenda is rewriting the bible and they will then have a translation geared towards homosexuality that removes any references towards homosexuality it's a tra- it's a paraphrase not a translation and we need to understand that god's word doesn't change because the culture changes It's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I know that churches and pastors of churches are looking for new ways to reach people because the culture is changing. And so they want to change like the culture changes. You can't. God stays the same always and always will. And we need to reach people according to the word of God. They need to understand the gospel message. Notice he says, now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. What is the gospel message? Let me tell you what the gospel message is. It's not a... It's not a message of feel good. It's not a message of God is your answer. He will take care of everything that you're going through. He'll answer all your prayers and he'll prosper you. That's not the message. You know, uh, Paul Crouch passed away this last week, Thanksgiving. And his message was a prosperity message. His message was uh, a faith message. Now, No disrespect for him passing away. I believe he's in heaven because he knew Jesus Christ. He proclaimed Jesus Christ. I believe he had the wrong message. You know, his message was on faith. And many times if you had faith that God would do this. Well, if he had enough faith, why did he die? He could have just had enough faith to say, Lord, I'm not ready to die yet. I'll I'll let you know when I die. I remember hearing Freddie Prince one time. I'm listening to him and he's talking about Jacob. And how Jacob says he sat down and he gave his spirit to the Lord. And so... Freddie Price said this, you see, God doesn't take our spirit, we give it. And so 
He's, he's telling me, when I'm ready, I'll let God know when I'm going to die. Wow. <laughs> wow. And yet Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Different gospel. What is the gospel? This is the gospel, and we see it in Genesis chapter 1. Man failed. God gave us an opportunity. We failed. We sinned. And we continue to sin. Oh, we could blame Adam and Eve, but if you were there, you would do the same thing. You would sin because you can't even live right right now. Even with a, being a believer and having the Spirit in your lives, it's hard for you to live right. Very difficult for you to love. Very difficult for you to be honest. You can still lie at times. You know, you don't want to look bad because of pride and so forth. It's very difficult. See, we failed God. And so what do we need? We need someone to help us. We need a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And by the way, there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. That's the gospel message. All these other ways are wrong. They're wrong. Christianity is the only way to heaven. Only way to heaven. So when Justin Bieber says, I'm a Christian, and then he does all those things that he's doing, he's not a Christian. He's not a Christian because there's no fruits. Remember John the, John the Baptist says, show us fruits worthy of your repentance. The gospel is this. We're in need of a Savior because we're sinners. And when we come to the Savior, we believe that there's a Savior. Now, believe doesn't mean you're saved. The devils believe and they fear and they tremble. But that's the first step. You have to acknowledge that there is a God and that Jesus is God. The next step is repentance. That means turning from your old life. I repent. I turn from my sins. I no longer want to do them. And I want to live for you, God. That's the hard part. We think being a Christian is just accepting Jesus dying on the cross. No. You need to repent from your sins. And you need to know that there's only one way. And it's through Jesus Christ. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Paul even agreed not that he needed to agree, but said there's only one mediator between God and man, and that man is Jesus Christ. And it's very clear. All other ways are broad, and they lead to destruction. And yet, <clears throat> we hear Christians say it all the time. Their relatives die, and they pass away. Never set a foot in church. Never claimed to be a believer. But hey, we're going to see them in heaven one day. Really? We need to be honest with what the gospel is. The gospel is good news, and it's come to save men from their sin if they repent and turn to God. That is the gospel message. And if not, as John 3, 18, 19, right around says, that Jesus said, I do not condemn you because you're condemned already. And so they're condemned without Christ. Condemned to what? Separation from God for eternity. And thus we get the word hell, sent to a pit, a fiery pit, forever and ever and ever. That's the gospel message. God has delivered us, redeemed us from the fiery pit, and set us on a path to heaven. Narrow is the way. Narrow is the way. Few seek after it. We need to understand the gospel message. When we understand the gospel message, when we've repented, and when God has entered into our lives, then we can love one another. Because the love will be sincere and pure in heart. Let me close. <clears throat> because you are born again. Love fervently, purely, and sin sincerely. Let's pray.